Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Our guest this evening, David Yoon, is the author of Frankly in Love, a tale of cultural expectations, racism, and first love that the Wall Street Journal calls funny, profane, and poignant. An instant New York Times bestseller, it was chosen as a best book of 2019 by School Library Journal and NPR, and was an Asian Pacific American Librarians Association honor book. David is also the author of the celebrated young adult novel, Super Fake Love Song, and he drew the illustrations for his wife, Nicole Yoon's Everything, Everything. Version Zero, his debut adult novel, follows three 20-something computer experts who want to literally break the internet. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Karen McManus, author of the number one bestseller, One of Us is Lying, along with The Cousins, and the much-anticipated You'll Be the Death of Me, Coming this November to bookstores and libraries near you. David, Karen, the screen is yours. Woohoo! All right. Thank you, Andy. And thanks, thanks for everybody us. for joining us. Um, so excited to talk to you, David. I had such a good time reading this book. And in fact, I was getting ready for our conversation last week. You know, so I was like jotting down some questions. And then, like you do, I went on Twitter to take a little break and see like what people are up to. And what I saw was a, like, it's kind of a viral post by this guy who used to work in technology. Uh -huh. And he told a story about how he had been visiting his mom. And then when he got home, he started getting served ads for her brand of toothpaste. Yes. And he was explaining how that happened, that he, you know, his phone recognized her phone and decided to serve him things that they could talk about. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is exactly I, what I this saw that book same is thread. about. <laughs> I saw that same thread. And his point, which was brilliant, was like, you know, that everyone thinks like my phone's listening in on me. It you, you actually give it way more information. It's it everything is it, it already has everything it needs and, and then some, so it doesn't even need to listen to you to make right. those connections. It's right. Yeah. It's so interesting. And so, you know, my first question for you is like, are you clairvoyant? <laughs> like, <No. laughs> you obviously you started writing this years ago. Right. Um, and yeah, of course this, this has been um, something that we've been wrestling with for a while, but it feels like the conversation is really heating up around the way that we have to, what we give up, you know, for the convenience and the connection that technology gives us. So what was your inspiration there? How did version zero get started? Yeah. I mean, I, I thought that, I honestly thought that things would kind of be better by now, but because um, oh, I started wow. this book like four <laughs> years ago and I was like, it couldn't possibly get worse. And then QAnon happens and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. it just got worse. Okay, um, there we go. Yeah. But, you know, I, I worked in tech for like over 12 years. I started um, when the internet was really new. I was a designer, then I went to interface design, and then you can't just do interface design without doing user experience, um, which is the entire right. product, thinking about marketing and acquisition and, and, and keeping customers, um, and also letting customers do what they want to do um, while making them do what the business wants to do. Uh, so there's a lot of right. like psychological manipulation happening. I mean, I, I learned a lot about how the internet sausage is made and it's not always pretty. I worked right. in like social media, um, cybersecurity in ad tech. That was very interesting too. Ad tech oh, is I not, bet. yeah, it's not advertising. It's like, that's the technology that scrapes information about you and builds a profile to serve you the perfect ad. Um, and at that company that I worked at, Lots of brilliant people, really good people, um, but we all had ad blockers installed on our computers. All of us. You did. Right, right. Because like, you know. We, we, exactly. And we were literally the non-smokers working at Philip, Mor Philip Morris. Like, <laughs> and that was sort of the moment where I was like, I need to write about this. Yeah. So so what was the journey between like that idea and the book actually being published? How did it like change and evolve during the, the years you thought it, about it? I mean, I, it was started out kind of like as a horror novel, actually. And <laughs> it was just like blood from the get-go. And it was just too much and too distracting. And it was actually more in response to kind of the 1%, the 99% protests that were happening. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was such a broad topic and it was just nothing but ideas and no characters. And, you know, Nikki's like, my wife, she's like, she's like, you got to stop talking about systems. You always go to systems. Um, talk about characters and people, make it really personal. And so yeah. the closest thing I had was technology because uh, right. technology and capitalism 
they're very intertwined. They're almost sort of indistinguishable. Um, and so I leaned hard into that and it, it, it worked out. Yeah. And, you know, I, we were talking a little bit in the green room before we got online with everyone else. And I used to work uh, tangentially in technology as well. Mm -hmm. I worked for a PR firm that consulted with um, tech firms. And so one of my favorite things about the book was the opening scenes um, when our protagonist, Max, who's still working at his tech company at that point, Ren, which I think, is it Twitter? Is that supposed to be like Twitter or is it Facebook? <laughs> I it's thought it was like, a bird, it was Twitter, but it could be both. Or it's a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Smash them all he's, at a, he's at a big social media company and he's having a conversation with the Brads, you know, two super tech guys <laughs> and his boss, who was like cool guy, Justin. And I just thought, oh, David has absolutely been in his rooms because this <laughs> reads so much like a tech company <laughs> conversation. So your background definitely shown through there. And I think I, it may, helped really make it feel real. I mean, there. When you work in tech, there are so so many absurd moments, um, where like, it it just sort of part of it just writes itself. I don't know if you've watched um, uh, Mythic Quest or Silicon Valley. I've um, seen Silicon Valley. Yes. I watched the entire first episode and I didn't laugh one time because it was just like <laughs> this is just my my job. It's not funny. <laughs> right. <laughs> Starting to have flashbacks here. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, and and like. Poor Max, you know, he's like this 20 something. He's idealistic. He's kind of naive, actually. He thinks that computers make, can make the world a better place, which is like this total tech um, cliche. And when he discovers that the Ren, the company that he works for, is doing shady stuff with user data, um, he blows the whistle, immediately gets fired, immediately gets blacklisted mm -hmm. from the industry that he used to love because now he has this crisis of faith. Um, and that's when he teams up with his friends. Um, and this reclusive tech billionaire who comes out of hiding to uh, enable him with his billions of dollars to create like the series of escalating hacks, you know, uh, yes. that get crazier and crazier to sort of expose the big five um, tech companies sins against humanity, so to speak. And that character is one of my favorites. So I do want to talk about him in more oh, pilot. detail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about the technology environment, you know, that you created, because you've got kind of like these big five companies that have real work, real world counterparts, at least, um, you know, mashed together. Like you say, there's like a Reddit and an Amazon and, mm -hmm. you know, they're very powerful and they employ a lot of people. But like, what do they actually produce? Um, and one of the things that I kept thinking about as I was reading this was what's kind of going on in like cryptocurrency now, where you've got something like Dogecoin, where people have become millionaires over something that started as a joke. <laughs> and yeah. so what, um, you know, what were you trying to say about the role of technology and what it, you know, does and, you know, what that actually creates? I mean, I think like Ted Chang, the, a writer who I basically worship, um, he, he was the one who said technology and, and capitalism are so intertwined, they're indistinguishable. Yeah. And it's true because you've got, you know, VC venture capitalists with just more money than they know what to do with. They have basically an infinite amount of money and they have this platform called the internet that can scale massively and very quickly. Um, and that's kind of a perfect storm to perform social engineering on a massive scale on a whim. Yeah. Um, you know, let's litter the streets with bird scooters and, and let's just see what happens. And right. it doesn't matter if they make money or lose money. They lost. They still have, don't make money. Um, Lyft still doesn't make money, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. And like Uber still doesn't make money. And these are like, it's this kind of bizarre form of um, uh, neoliberal socialism where you've yeah. got just a ton of money trickling down. Um, and we don't know, it's not particularly solving any problems. It's just sort of creating new ones and their social experiments. So it, the fact that like you can do whatever you want without much purpose behind it is perfect for something like Dogecoin. It just is. Right out and see what happens. <laughs> Couple of people get rich. That's great. Yeah. It's a lottery effect, you know. You get some real winners, and um, then you, like you say, you have some unintentional consequences. Uh, yeah, often like the environment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the interesting things, like you mentioned, you know, they're they're disillusioned, and they sort of start with these series of hacks. Um, you know, trying to kind of shut down some of these big sites so that people aren't spending all of their time online. Mm -hmm. um, and they're successful, right? To a point. To a point, yeah. people keep coming back. And what do you think it is that makes it so hard for people to disengage? 
I, it's gotta be, um, the, there, there are just certain technologies that inadvertently, like we can't engineer this stuff. Like they really tap into a deep primal, uh, need like television yeah. really tapped into our orientation response. We got to see what's happening outside the cave so we don't get eaten. And right, that, right. Ke- that keeps us glued to TV. Uh, cars um, like tap into our territorial nature. Uh, you cut me off or whatever. And mm-hmm. or then we get road rage. And I think the internet, especially social media, taps into our need for validation. You know, we just want to yeah. be liked. Um, but suddenly when you have like thousands of people in the same room, all jockeying for likes then it becomes kind of weird you know it's not yeah. it's not normal our brains i don't think are equipped to handle with that kind of scale and speed yeah and um it's a it's, it's a worthy goal i think of our protagonists you know to try and, and disrupt that um but they're having a hard time making yeah. it you know making a real impact until we get to pilot Markham, who was a fascinating character. So he's, tell us a little bit about him. He's the reclusive billionaire. He's a tech genius. He's like a legend. Um, You know, he's basically a hermit now, but he decides to join with our protagonist. Yeah, so he sees what what Max and company are up to. Um, Like when he sees Max's hacker group, which is called Version Zero, so hence the title, um, they, they take down all the likes. And people are freaking out. They're like, I want my likes back. And Pilot sees this and he gets in touch with them. And he's like, I like what you're doing. And Pilot Markham is like a Mark Zuckerberg. But imagine if he went into hiding sort of J.D. Salinger style. Um, he comes out of hiding and he's like, look, I built this tech world and I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of my own creation. And it's I'm, I'm filled with regret um, because it ruined my relationship with my daughter and my wife and um and I want to make it right. I want to atone for my mistakes. And so they team up and start to get pretty crazy with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll leave it at that so that we don't spoil anything for people who haven't yet read the book. But you're going to want to read the book to see how all of this plays out. Because yeah. it's Let's a just, really fascinating. <laughs> Let's just say Pilot has an agenda of his own. That yeah, Max doesn't know not, about. he's not telling them everything yeah, you everything. know like all good characters he has he's holding a few things back from the <laughs> other characters um but tell us a little bit more about max you know your protagonist like we said you said at the beginning he's idealistic like he loves his job he thinks it's doing a good thing um he's mm-hmm. making the world a better place um but he yeah. also you know he has a family who doesn't totally understand what he does you know mm-hmm. they're they're trying to define it for him like what's his what's his journey through this it, his journey actually is is um essentially the immigrant kid journey he's he's a doesn't he's salvadoran he doesn't really speak spanish all that well um his parents are he loves his parents to death they're really sweet but he they don't understand him um, and he doesn't, he never feels like he kind of belongs. And that's sort of yeah. every immigrant kid is always caught between cultures. And for him, the escape is technology. So he can build his own world and his own place to, to belong in. And that's why he's so idealistic about it. He really believes all that talk about utopias and, and cyberspace and, you know, making this perfect world where you can be whoever you want to be on your own rules, you know, beholden to nobody. Um, so it's even worse for him when he gets like just his butt kicked and fired yeah. and blacklisted. Poor Max. And I think it doesn't help that he's in love with his best friend's girl, um, Akiko, who also works at Ren. She's a brilliant programming lead. And um, they connect on a level that, you know, she, she and her boyfriend don't because he's kind of this lovable meathead dude. Um, right. But he can, Max can never be with her. So he's pining away. He's a, he wants to belong somewhere and he wants to love Akiko. And he's just always unsatisfied. Yeah, he never, yeah. He never quite knows where his place is throughout. Yeah. And I think that really came across for him. And, and it was an interesting dynamic between these characters. Because like you say, you know, he's intellectually and emotionally, he's so connected to Akiko. But Shane has is also his friend. He really cares about him. He doesn't want to hurt him. And, you know, maybe those two are actually kind of well suited to each other. Um, Mm -hmm. even though, even though they, like you say, might not be at the same intellectual level. So having 
having a dynamic like that try and do these like big projects while you have all that those emotions running underneath it as well was that something you sort of consciously was were juggling throughout the plot yeah and just because the projects the hacks that Max and Akiko have to come up with these hacks together because they're they are the the core of the team and as a result they get closer and closer because they spend so much time together and shane the boyfriend um doesn't understand what's happening and he's he starts to be like well max is spending a lot of time with my girl you know and um and at the same time you know pilot is giving them a lot of attention too and max is almost treating pilot like a proxy dad you know he's he's the the fictitious dad that understands everything max is doing exactly um and so there's a lot of misplaced, misplaced love, misplaced affection. Um, and it, it sort of drives Max to, to do things that um, he can't control later on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have, um, so without any spoilers, but is there a scene that you particularly enjoyed writing? And then I'm going to tell you what my favorite scene is, but I want to hear yours first. Oh, okay. Uh, I like the scene where um, like Max and Akiko are like, kind of under this poncho at the beach and they're trying to figure out how they would fix the internet if they could start all over from scratch and like fix the internet how would they do it so they're having this like kind of philosophical technical discussion but at the same time they're getting physically closer and yeah. max is just dying inside he's like i just want you <laughs> and he that can was tell so that, angsty <laughs> i know <laughs> and you can tell that akiko's you know she's not neutral about him. Like she's kind of into him too, but she knows right. that Shane is just beyond the dune playing, you know, bocce ball. Um, and, and they can't, it, it's just, they keep missing each other, but they're so close at the same time. And that was a yeah. lot of fun. Cause I was balancing this love triangle, but also ideas about the internet, which can be kind of like sterile, but to make them personal to them and make them be really passionate about them was, I really wanted to do that. So right. That's my favorite and you scene. can see sort of this alternate universe where they would be a perfect partnership in all kinds of ways, you know, know. that just aren't possible <laughs> for them. Another <laughs> book, perhaps, David. <laughs> well, I don't, I can't say too much about my favorite scene because it probably is a little bit spoilery, but uh-huh. there is a point where the tech giants are kind of like brought together. And I just thought that was so cool, how the setup, um, and then, you know, of course, there's lots that happens after that, but just kind of the idea of these, you know, minds coming together and, and talking at the level that they were at, these, you know, creators and giants of technology. It was very Yeah, and cool. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because that, that was, I really, really loved writing that. I mean, one of my big goals was, was to, like, just make people aware that the internet is not just like a cloud. We call it the cloud, but it's not right. a cloud. It's silicon and hardware and electricity and air conditioning and 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 um and also it's people. And yeah. I've I've worked like I worked across from across the the cube farm um, from let's just say a really hugely popular party inv- invite service. Um, and I was, was directly across from the guy who did uh, content moderation. And so he was always like, David, come here. Look at this stuff they try to post. It's ridiculous. And, <laughs> and there's like naked people. And he's like, look at this. Oh, my God. They're trying to plan an orgy. I have to flag this. <laughs> and there was no privacy. We were just in the office. And this right. is like in a normal office environment and there was nothing stopping anyone from copying those pictures or writing down names or anything. Right. And um, so I just want people to be aware that when you use the internet, when you use your phone, it's not just some, you know, perfect algorithm in a clean factory somewhere. It's people. And it is those, it is the big five tech CEOs um, that make these decisions and, and create your culture really yeah they they sort of create like more and more like you need a phone and a phone service and an app registration right and you can't imagine not having that yeah and it's like just to have friends um right you need to be registered on all these corporate services and be surveilled at all moments and i just want people to be aware of that and uh what is social what role does social media play for you like as an author and And a human. Oh, <laughs> how how much do you use it? Do you feel that you ever get addicted, or you need to step back, or how do you manage the, it? I get the feeling you and I can relate to 
our relationship with social media. It's, it's <laughs> mostly for work. I mean, I mm-hmm. like when I, when I was a user experience expert, you know, in another life, um, I would register for everything I could get my hands on because I wanted to learn yeah. um, what people were doing. But after a while, you know, I, had, I quit Facebook um, just because it was getting too bonkers. And I don't really post anything personal. Um, yeah. It's really no, just for same. work and just to yeah. connect with readers and stuff. Um, I don't actually think the internet can be used for any any kind of personal development because it is so public um, and it's so fraught with security risks that right. I, yeah, I mean, my, I found that using um, a group shared photo album on, on iOS is like my favorite way of sharing photos with friends. Really? <laughs> it's, it's like a tiny social network of like 12 people, basically. Yes. <laughs> and that's it. It's probably about as like, you know, personal as you can get. Yeah. So my, my relationship with social media is just like, Nope, yeah. that's far enough. Just gonna post this and run away. <laughs> <laughs> how about you? Like, what do you? How do you use it? Similar, you know, it's interesting. When I was like a baby writer, um, 2015 or so, when I wasn't published, I actually found Twitter incredibly helpful for connecting mm-hmm. with other writers because um, I didn't know any writers in person, and all of a sudden I was meeting all these people who had the same questions I had, who were looking for people to look at their manuscript. And, you were a fearless fifteener. I wasn't, I didn't get published till 2017, but I oh, got okay, on, okay. on, you know, like online on 2015. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was there, but not doing much. Um, I joined the writing community then. Yeah. And, cool. and I, I made friends who are still friends now and they're still critique partners. Um, but my relationship with the platform changed so much as I advanced in my career, you know, because mm-hmm. all of a sudden I couldn't really use it the same way. You know, there were more people paying attention to me. There were more people who, you know, were asking me questions and I couldn't just sort of jump on there and be in the middle of conversations anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I missed that a little bit. Um, but also I, I'm, I'm able to connect with a lot more readers now, but it is more, like you say, it's more for work. You know, yeah, I think yeah, you sort of, sure. you have to put up kind of more boundaries, I think, mm-hmm. when there are, are more people who are aware that you exist um, yeah, and you have yeah. to make sure that you guard your time so that you can keep doing your work. And it's tough. Like you're basically, you, we're basically public figures. So it's, it's a little different for us, but, um, but I mean, even as, that aside, like I, I recently I was, was uh, scrolling the fees just way too much just because of everything that was going on. Yes, um, like yeah. up until, up until like a couple of months before the Capitol riot, I was on my phone nonstop. And, I, was I, was, I was just in fight or flight mode constantly. Yeah. And I realized it was just killing my sleep and my, I was cranky all the time and um, talked to Nikki about it. Talked to my therapist about it. They're like, take a break from your internet. And I, so I stopped reading the bad stuff like news, but I also stopped reading the good stuff too. Um, like my geek news and my funny gifts and whatever, yeah. because I yeah. realized that my room, my, my house, my brain was like a house and all the rooms were filled with stuff. Like it, I'd right. become like a mental hoarder, you know, <laughs> and yeah. you, can't, you can never get comfortable <laughs> in a hoarder house. Um, and within like two or three days, you know, I would sit down to meditate and I, I flash back super hard to high school. Like I felt like I was in my high school bedroom with, with yeah. just my records and my tapes and my books and magazines. And that was the last time I realized that was the last time in my life that I had the most headspace to yeah. just be alone with my thoughts. And so I, I've really kept it up. Like I'm not looking at the internet very much at all. Um, and life is, life is better. I got to say. Yeah. But it makes no, me wonder. It makes me wonder. So speaking of high school, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, of course, oh, yeah. your your category change. So you've got your start in YA, released a couple of very popular books, um, and this is your adult debut. So yeah. how was that experience? Um, you know, what what did you like best about it? Um, I well, why is like because I I saw everything that was happening with Nikki, and I saw the community and the writers, the the group of writers, the camaraderie and how everyone was cheerleading for everyone else and we'd all like read we'd all read read each other's stuff and that was very very cool it was different from i went to an la um la times book festival at usc and i ran into a fellow parent at my daughter's school he's an author too and he was like dude it's a zero-sum game in an adult man you know if you have a book about the history of hot dogs and someone else has the same book you're mortal enemies and I'm like, really? it's not like that in YA. 
So I mean, wow, cold. It, yeah, it drew me to that. And also like, I, I vividly remember what it was like to be in high school. Um, I do too. Yeah. yeah. I think and that my, helps, right? <laughs> it helps yeah, us it totally do our does, job. For sure. And my thesis at Emerson college was a collection of short stories about kids in middle school. I just, I'm, I'm still fascinated by like childhood and, and how you see the world with brand new eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of why I started there. Um, thinking a lot about my parents. Cause I also had my own, I had my own daughter and my dad was getting sick. Um, he had terminal cancer. So it makes me think a lot about like review my childhood, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's all about like hope and potential, right. you know, cause you're a young adult and you're going to figure out what kind of person you want to be. Um, we don't know what the internet's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the jury is very much out on has the internet been worth it at all? And for that reason, I was like, it's got to be adult because adults, I feel like, um, <clears throat> is not necessarily always about hope or potential. Right. It's a lot of stuff we're still working through. And I yeah. feel like we're still working through this. Yeah. 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 I think it, it would be interesting, an interesting exercise to think about it as a YA book, but it works really well as young adults. So. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. So what is um next for you then? Is your next book going to be adult or are you still figuring um, that out? I mean, obviously you've got an imprint that you're also working on. So you get some <laughs> other stuff to do, but. I know I'm busy, but like I, I just sold a book uh, to yeah. Mark Tavani, same editor as, as um, version zero. And okay. So you will have another. He's amazing. Is it a he, sequel? <laughs> no, 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 no. He, but he, he like sees stuff in my book that I, I didn't see and I, I try to play it cool and I'm like oh yeah I totally meant to do that but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's called City of Orange and this one is another adult book um, it's a post-apocalyptic story about this dude who wakes up um, with no memory the world has ended and he's got to figure out he knows he has a wife and daughter and he, he's got to figure out if they're still alive and they're, if they're okay um, so that's the story uh, and then Nikki and I mm, are working on something together maybe um, very cool yeah and that's why and yeah and then there's other stuff that's sort of percolating in the background as usual yeah yeah um, but the yeah. the adult will be your next book is that coming out next year or uh yeah they're thinking you know next yet? year yeah okay. we're talking about covers so we're we're, oh, we're yeah. on track for you're next close. year yeah. yeah you're 2022 <laughs> yeah so what's your process like are you a fast writer do you kind of get an idea and <laughs> sort of slam it out or are you uh I mean, do you take your time I, um, I do the, you know, David Arnold, um, he's, we're having drinks and we're talking about process and, and he was like, um, it's kind of like going on a, on a road trip at night. Like, you know, what cities you're going to hit and pretend your GPS doesn't work. Um, (laughs) (laughs) and all you can see is what's in your headlights, but you can't see it beyond that. And so, you know, you're going to get to the city eventually. You just don't know exactly how. And so you leave room for a little spontaneity in between yeah. major plot points and that's kind of how I outline um and then when I'm writing yeah I go, I go for on a good day it's like two to three thousand words a day um that's like when I'm feeling really great uh, <laughs> typically it's like 1200 or something like still okay. though yeah. if you if you're as long as you're getting words out you know you'll get to the end of that book eventually so I mean how long how long can you write for I can only write I, for like six hours before I start to run I out of gas. I can write a really long time. I have oh, really? written for like 14 hours straight at one what? point. Yeah, I've written like 15,000 words in a day when oh for whatever God. one of us is lying because that book just like poured out of me. It just and had it was to get like, out. Ah. Yeah, that's the most I've ever done. But, you know, I never, um, I don't have word count goals because I find that if like, the, if, if it's flowing, mm-hmm. I will write more than I intend to write. Um, and if it's not... I have to take a step back because something's yeah. going on and it doesn't matter how many words I try to put on the page. They probably won't be right. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally against word count goals too. It's just like, yeah. if you sit down and you sit there for four hours and you don't write a single word, you're still putting work in. I mean, it sucks, but like, yeah, you know, it still counts because um, you're working through stuff in your head. So yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you have to like watch Netflix and let your brain rest. So that all counts. <laughs> or or play Simon's Cat. I'm playing mm-hmm. lots of Simon's Cat. <laughs> Probably too much because when I close my eyes, I see the puzzle bricks. It's yeah, really maybe. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> you really... should take a step back. 
stuck. <laughs> stuck. <laughs> All right. I think I've got the chat here. Um, and it is time to move on to Q&A. So let oh, cool. me pull these up here. Um, let me see. Here is someone who's saying, mentioning that they worked with Apple Education and told, installed TV studio in school district. When I retired, I gave up iPhone to use a flip phone. What ways can we protect ourselves? What ways can we protect ourselves? I don't know. I actually don't know. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to write this book is be because this stuff is so unresolved. Um, there is no good answer. I, th especially if you sort of expand the question to how do you live um, like a hypocrisy free life in the modern capitalist America? Um, you know, I, let's say this pizza company is against your beliefs. And so don't shop at the pizza company, but that becomes impossible when you use an app and the app contains code libraries from 20 different companies that you've never heard of. Right. Um, so it, and, and also maybe the hardware was built by children in Vietnam. Like you have no idea. God, yeah. um, so the yeah. scope of, of capitalism is so large. It's, it's so much bigger than an individual that it's hard to know, like, how do you, how do you protect yourself? Um, and these days, if you're not on the internet, if you don't have a phone, you're kind of, it's almost like you're a Luddite. Like you, you, you might as well ride a horse around town. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's and sort how of old is your, how old is your daughter, David? She's nine. She's nine. Um, okay. So she's not like quite at the age where everybody has a phone or is she? Some of her friends have phones and I'm like, hell no. And I've, I've, yeah. told, I've told her about like how it works and I've told her how social media is all fake um, and how influences are all fake and, and how nothing gets deleted really. Like how all the data on TikTok right. is, you know, the Chinese government can ask for it and without a warrant and, and the company is uh, obligated to give to the government. And it, government aside, people working at these companies can see everything you're doing. Like I saw with that very popular party invite service. Right. Um, so it's it's just something she's she's become really aware of this stuff because of me because I'm really right, paranoid right, about this. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But, ultimately, but it's tricky. It's yeah. tricky with kids, you know, because all their friends at a certain age, that's begins to be how they communicate. Um, so you have yeah. to have those conversations sooner than you might want. Totally. My 16 year old nephew, meanwhile, is he's been stuck at home like all of us. And he yeah. is on Fortnite every night. Um, yeah. Talk, talking with his friends, not yep. even really playing, just talking with his friends. No, just talking. Yeah. I have a 15 year old yeah. who does that as well. But when you think about the technologies involved to enable that, it's like you need internet, you need telecom, you need Nintendo Switch, you need uh, Discord. Um, you need so many services and products um, that cost thousands just to hang out with friends. It, it's um, it's a good thing because he gets this to hang out with them, but it's also it, it's it's a lot, you know. Yeah, for sure. A yeah. similar question is about, um, or it's kind of a suggestion is you know not posting kids' photos online, not because nothing is private on the internet. And do you agree with uh, that? Yes, absolutely. Don't do it. There was. Um, this art collective in, gosh, Norway or something, they performed this experiment where they just scraped um, kids' photos off of Instagram, which is a snap. It's so easy. And then because it's all, <clears throat> it's all like Creative Commons licensing, I don't know how it works, but they were selling mugs with other people's kids' faces on them. And they didn't actually sell them. They made a store and said, do you like these mugs? And they would notify the, the parents. And and they would be like, don't worry, we're not going to sell these. We're doing this as, you know, to make a point. Like, this stuff is public. And what's a little scarier is, and this is why Version Zero had to be an adult book, I think, is because um, I also had a friend who works at, as a DA in Los Angeles. And he specializes in child porn. And, <clears throat> and he's like, don't ever post your kid online, ever, for any reason. Um, wow. And when, when um, kind of Elsa Gate happened on YouTube, and also when there was that child porn scandal on YouTube where um, child pornographers were, were uh, marking timelines of videos of parts that they liked oh. and then putting actual child porn links in the comments. And YouTube was like saying, oh, we can't do anything about it. We didn't notice it, which is total bullshit. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is as bad as you think it is. Um, and so we never put my daughter online. 
Um, if we do, yeah. we're always hiding a face or, you know, so you gotta yeah, be really yeah. careful, especially if you're a public figure. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. You how, do. Wait, how old are your kids? I just have one and he is, he's about to be 15. Oh, wow. And so now he's at the age where, you know, he doesn't want me to post about him because he has a life <laughs> and it's his own business. Um, but even when he was, when he was a younger kid, I was very careful not to, you know, put him out there because I, you know, he, a, a, kid, a little kid can't give their consent for, for, you know, yeah, public, yeah. um, public sharing of their information, even if you think it's appropriate. So, totally, so I just yeah. chose not to do that. Um, and I think, um, he's happy about that now. Yeah. I think that's really smart of you. Um, one other question I think we have time for, um, <clears throat> apropos to the earlier discussion, could you talk about how, um, personality affects coding versions and software development? That's an interesting. Personality. Question. Interesting. I mean, the first thing I think of when I hear a question like that is how, um, facial recognition software doesn't do very well with black people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just thinking about like the bias inherent in, in, uh, technology development like when you hang out with these teams they're all kind of the same you know they're all pretty well off they they're all um mostly dudes they're they're um they're brads <laughs> yeah they they have a certain level of affluence i remember when it was like what was it sweet green was like we're going to go cashless um and i was like wait a second what about people who need to pay with cash or ebt right. That's that's not fair, and it was obviously coming from a place of privilege, yeah. and and so I think I think bias is really baked into a lot of technology, because um, we're just people. Of course, it is. Our, all of our biases are always baked into everything we do, um, but I I think what that reveals is that we, the way we talk about technology is always like it's neutral, it's utopian, utopian, um, and it's uh, egalitarian and democratic and fair. Uh, and I think that comes from its counterculture origins from like back in the sixties, like Steve jobs and Steve Wozniak were both a couple hippies. Um, but when you mix in billions of dollars of venture capital, then that quickly changes. Yeah, and, but changes we're still left with the language, that idealistic language. Right. Right. And that really hasn't changed after all this time. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Oh, we have another one. I, I think is that. Could you talk about Oh, one more. Yeah. Could you talk about some of the other books and movies that influenced this and maybe some of the tropes from other genres that influenced it, especially in regard to terminology? Oh, and words you created. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was reading Which a lot a of cool aspects. Of the book. <laughs> There's like a bunch of made up words in this book because I couldn't help myself. I was reading a lot of um, Edward Lear, you know, the owl and the pussycat. They mm -hmm. own the pussycat. I went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. And um, he just makes up words like a runcible spoon, you know, <laughs> and I was like, I love it. I want to do this too. Um, and I was reading a lot of Dr. Seuss too, and he makes up tons of words. Yeah. Um, but I was actually uh, really influenced by nature shows because I was trying to figure out how to write about technology. And in, in early drafts, it was like, literally, I would spell out Twitter and I had Snapchat in there. Um, yeah. I had stuff that people don't really use anymore. And I was like, this, this is a problem because as soon as the book comes out, it's going to be out of date and it's going to feel kind of stupid. Right. So yeah. I decided to set it way back in 2018, um, almost like a historical fiction piece. And I, I just kind of tossed in these little asides. Like I call them my David Attenborough sides where we're explaining what virality means or what um, crowdsourcing means, you know? Right, right. And it, you, it's like when David Attenborough kind of comes yeah, in and he's like, note. yeah, he's like, going viral was defined as you know, <laughs> extremely popular. And, <laughs> and so that gave it the distance, like the psychic distance that it needed to, to show how kind of strange our world is and how sort of slightly dystopian it is. What were some of your made up words? Um, so closing and chails. That sounds real. <laughs> <laughs> All chails of grass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mickey was like, I didn't, I thought I was, I thought I was really stupid, but they're fake, you idiot. And I'm like, sorry. And the copy <laughs> editor, the poor copy editor was like, was this intentional? Yeah. Copy editors are just very <laughs> focused. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you talk about character? What makes a character in fiction work or not work for you? And how do you keep yourself true? What makes a character in fiction work? Um, really, the character has to be a human being. I mean, it seems it's kind of a dumb answer, but like, it's, like sometimes characters can be stand-ins for ideas and and then your story becomes more of an allegory than, than a real story that you can like dive into and really experience. And sometimes that can work, but I think most times um, the character has to be someone who uh, really wants something and is, is struggling to figure something out either within yeah. them or outside of them. Um, Cause we all are, you know, we're all, none, none of us are like perfect and comfortable. Yeah. I struggle with stuff every day. No, I totally agree. And that's what I think engages the reader, right? They want to see this person get what they want, learn what they need to learn, yeah. you know, get past whatever fear is holding them back and, you know, just get a resolution, even if it's mm -hmm. not uh, wrapped up in a neat bow, but they've, they've completed that journey. Yeah, totally. And I, I feel, I think one trick I like to do is like, I, I mean, I meditate and I journal and I talk to my therapist and it's built up this really nice awareness. I'm just really aware of how I'm feeling and stuff and it's really healthy. So if I'm upset for some reason, I I'll sit there and I'll think about it and be like, Oh, I'm upset because X, Y, and Z. And then I can get over it. Um, and then I, I pretend that I didn't. And I'm like, what if I never did? What if it let this fester and became like a lifelong problem? And then you can have the beginnings of a character there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The unexamined oh, self is like, makes for great characters. <laughs> All right. Well, on that excellent piece of writerly advice, uh, we will close. So I want to thank everybody who joined and thank the Free Library of Philadelphia for hosting such a wonderful event. And thank you, David, for writing version zero. You guys definitely pick it up and check it out. It is a fantastic read. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah.